What's good? It's Wug. Please like the video, subscribe to the channel if you are into the fight talk. We have Gary Russell Jr., 31 wins and one loss, defending his WBC featherweight title against Mark Magsayo, 23 wins and zero losses. This will be the first time Gary Russell has returned to the ring since his win over Tugstot, also known as King Tug Niambiar, in February 2020. So Gary Russell Jr. has not fought since the beginning of the COVID pandemic. And the longtime WBC champ, Russell, who's been the champion since 2015, fighting only once per year, every year since winning the title against Johnny Gonzalez, except for, of course, 2021, he didn't fight at all. Gary Russell Jr. has actually been stricken with a fair amount of family tragedy just over the past couple years. His brother, Gary Busa Russell. Now, the Russell family, it's six brothers, all named Gary Russell after their dad, the fourth of the six brothers. So this would be the next youngest after Gary Antonio Russell, who you've been seeing a lot more active in recent years, even than his champion brother, this one, Gary Russell Jr. But Busa passed away in 2020. Not only that, but you know, their dad, the patriarch of the family, Gary Russell Sr., you know, Gary Russell Jr.'s trainer, mentor, and so forth, he is now an amputee due to diabetes complications. So Gary Russell Jr. said that for this upcoming fight against Max Sayo, he's largely been training himself. His dad has not been in the gym with him day in and day out like he normally is. He tries to check in via phone and monitor the sessions, but... This is going to be pretty different for Gary Russell Jr. So, you know, he made his name, I say, like in 2012, 2013. I mean, he was a part of the Olympic team. He wasn't able to compete in the actual Olympics because he had passed out in the Olympic dorm room, you know, just before the weigh-in. So he didn't compete in the Olympics, but he was a great amateur, uh, over 150 wins. Uh, he beat Leo Santa Cruz in the amateurs. And, you know, he was off to a super hot start. And then in 2013, he started having, you know, higher profile fights where you would see him featured on some, you know, pretty prominent undercards. And then in 2014, he has a showdown with Vasily Lomachenko, who at the time was one in one as a professional, Vasily Lomachenko was obviously a two-time Olympic gold medalist, super high pedigree, so high of a pedigree to the point where even though Lomachenko was one and one because he had had a loss, a controversial loss, but a decision loss to Orlando Salido, super rugged fighter, roughhouse tactics, kind of borderline low blows. A lot of people would say that it wasn't even borderline. But they thought that Lomachenko versus Salido was poorly officiated. Salido came away with the victory, putting Lomachenko again at one and one. And Lomachenko going into the fight versus Gary Russell Jr. in his very next bout was actually the favorite against Gary Russell Jr., who at the time was undefeated, electrifying hand speed. But that tells you how highly touted Lomachenko had been even since 2014. So Gary Russell enters this fight with Lomachenko. And it should be noted that Russell, you know, there are different levels of hand speed. I mean, there are a lot of people with fast hands, a lot of people who, when you see them throw combinations, they look like their hands are just moving at very high speeds. You see them working out before the fight, and you see, see them in training. Gary Russell Jr. is one of these fighters who actually has special hand speed. The type of hand speed that you can't, you can't work it out and train to the point where you develop hand speed to that level. You're either born with that type of electrifying hand speed or you're not. It's like a very short list, like maybe Zab Judah, prime Roy Jones Jr., like maybe Shane Mosley when he would whip the right hand, you know, in his prime. But Gary Russell Jr. has a type of punching speed where if you blink, you just missed it. You could have missed two punches, three punches, but he just has next level hand speed to where I would say that it, he might have the fastest hands pound for pound in boxing. It's that ridiculous. So I had, you know, high expectations and couldn't wait for this fight between Russell and Lomachenko. Well, Lomachenko won a majority decision over Gary Russell Jr. He just exercised brilliant footwork, great angles and movement. Basically, all of, 
the ingredients that we have come to make Lomachenko what he is today and what he's been over the past few years. But, you know, to this day, that remains Gary Russell Jr.'s only loss. And so he rebounded pretty quickly from that fight against Lomachenko, where Russell wins a fight via unanimous decision about a half a year later, and then he fights for the WBC featherweight title against Johnny Gonzalez, who had earned that title, knocking Abner Mares out for the belt. So Johnny Gonzalez enters the ring against Gary Russell Jr. Russell is able to jump into the pocket, let power punches go and get out of harm's way before Johnny Gonzalez could come back with the counters. So Gonzalez was kind of like intelligent pressure style against Russell. R Russell would take a step back, take a step back, throw a couple punches, change angles, and then leap in for a couple quick punches and get out. Now, Russell, as fast as his hands are, his feet are extraordinarily fast too. Like, he doesn't show it to the same degree. He's not, like, on the balls of his feet moving around like a young Cassius Clay. But when it's go time, when it's time to let the punches go, when it's time to turn the angle and get out of harm's way, Gary Russell Jr. has phenomenal foot speed as well. He's got really good um, trunk movement, upper body movement too. So Johnny Gonzalez gets knocked out by Gary Russell Jr. in the fourth round, making Gary Russell Jr. the WBC featherweight champion. That might still be Russell's most impressive win to date, just because he basically obliterated somebody who we just saw obliterate a very good fighter in Abner Mares. And since becoming champion, Russell has defended his belt successfully six times. Again, it hasn't been against the fighters that we wanted to see him fight against, and it looks like it had been just a pattern of missed opportunity. Like, we wanted to see him fight Leo Santa Cruz, Carl Frampton, neither of those fights happened. So Gary Russell Jr. is, you know, beating guys like uh, Oscar es Escandone, uh, Patrick Hyland. He did beat Joseph Jojo Diaz, like in his third title defense. And, you know, it should be said about Gary Russell's, uh, you know, title defenses since becoming champion. He gets a lot of slack and, you know, rightfully so because he hasn't fought the fights that matter, like the ones that are truly legacy building. Like just a couple years ago, it would have been great if he were to fight uh, Josh Warrington, who had won the title versus Lee Selby, defended successfully against Carl Frampton. That would have been a great legacy builder. Josh Warrington is actually going to be fighting for the title again against Kiko Martinez, which, you know, Josh Warrington lost his IBF belt before he got in the ring with Mauricio Lara because he didn't want to have another fight with Kid Galahad. So he gets stripped of the title, basically vacates that. Then he gets knocked out against huge underdog, pretty much unknown Mauricio Lara. They try to have a rematch. It was stopped prematurely due to a head clash. So it's still unresolved unfinished business for Josh Warrington, but yeah, he was hot for a minute with the IBF belt, and it would have been a great opportunity for Russell to fight him, but that fight didn't get made. You know, if Gary Russell Jr. gets out of this fight with Mark Maxayo, it would be great if he fights Emmanuel Navarrete, who's been making a lot of noise at featherweight. He's one of the belt holders right now, and I'd say that he's probably the hottest featherweight in the game right now. Just the way that he's beating his opponents, his, uh, his fight style, his volume. I would love to see Gary Russell Jr. versus Emmanuel Navarrete, but for promotional reasons and so forth, I, I just don't know if that fight could get made. But I was saying that Russell hasn't been fighting the fights that matter, but he does have a couple title wins that have been aging well, like his win over Joseph Jojo Diaz. At the time, and for a long time, that was Diaz's only defeat. And then the two title defenses since that were against Kiko Martinez, who, you know, at a time, just, you know, before an, a huge upset knockout for Kiko Martinez, one of the upsets of the year, shoot, one of the knockouts of the year, to be honest, last year, 2021, against Kid Galahad, Kiko Martinez wins the IBF belt against Kid Galahad. And Galahad was, you know, boxing his ears off. Like in the first half of the fight, Kid Galahad was looking great. You hear the broadcaster just talking, just glowing and going on about how great Kid Galahad's fighting. And then Kiko Martinez starts catching up with him and just ends up putting him out in the sixth round. So, 
you know, just before that, Kiko Martinez had lost to Zelfa Barrett, like, via unanimous decision, just two fights before that upset win over Kid Galahad. So, you know, Kiko Martinez was still seen as, like, a good gatekeeper, but he was almost, like, in journeyman status because of his age, because of some of the losses that he had had prior. But between the Kiko Martinez win, the Joseph Jojo Diaz win, obviously the Johnny Gonzalez win, and then most recently, again, just before the pandemic, against Tugstock King Tug Niambiar, who, you know, most recently lost to another hot prospect, Chris Colbert, another guy with super fast hands. But yeah, that win over King Tug, the win over Kiko Martinez, the win over Joseph Jojo Diaz, all quality wins for Gary Russell Jr., pretty much in hindsight. Because, you know, he stopped G Kiko Martinez in the fifth round, Gary Russell Jr. did. That's his last knockout. His last knockout before that was against S. Candone. So Gary Russell Jr., his last two out of three wins have come via unanimous decision against Joseph Jojo Diaz and King Tug Niambiar. But again, a lot of these wins that were not exciting fights when the fights were made because it wasn't Leo Santa Cruz. It wasn't Carl Frampton. But because of the quality of the fighters that it, it you know it turns out you watch the guys who lose to Russell continue to fight you're like oh damn okay they're better you know than that than I thought they were or in the case of Kiko Martinez oh man he still has a lot of gas in the tank but that doesn't stop it from feeling like this has been a very underwhelming title reign for Gary Russell Jr in these last 6 years almost 7 years well now he's fighting the Freddie Roach trained Mark Magsayo, who's coming off of a knockout win versus Julio Ceja. This Julio Ceja knockout to Mark Magsayo took place on the Manny Pacquiao versus Jordanis Ugas undercard. And this was one of the knockouts of the year. And in that fight, Julio Ceja was really brutalizing Magsayo to the body. Like, it, Richard Dwyer often says, and Richard Dwyer is an online boxing analyst, a gambler's advisory. But he often says, knockouts cause amnesia. And what he means by that is, you know, when a knockout occurs, you forget about everything that happened prior to the knockout in the fight. So, yeah, Maxayo versus Seha. Seha was coming on strong. And Seha has fought some of the best fighters of the generation, at least in that weight class. He's fought uh, Brandon Figueroa to a draw right before that Maxayo fight. So Seha was coming off of a draw with Brandon Figueroa. And just before that, he had lost via TKO, eighth round TKO to Guillermo Rigondeaux in a pretty entertaining fight by the way. Not really par for the course for a Rigondeaux fight, reputation-wise, right? But Julio Ceja was coming on strong against Maxayo, really just punishing him to the body where you saw Maxayo start to back up, slow down, and it you know started to look like, damn, I don't know if this hot prospect Maxayo is going to be able to handle this veteran, this tested veteran Julio Ceja. Well, Maxayo is a strong dude, and he's got very hard punches. He's, he throws a jab that just pops. He throws a hard right hand. He throws a, a hard, scooping left hook that kind of has an upward angle on it, and he throws it in combination. Like, he'll throw the uh, right hand, then follow it up with the uppercut slash hook. It's kind of a hook-uppercut mix. But he'll also, you know, start to go to the body a little bit. I'm not sold totally on his footwork, but he is a very hard puncher. He also has a very good right uppercut, like not a hook, you know, like the one with the left hand, but he throws a very nice right uppercut. And, you know, his fight before the Pablo Cruz fight was a split decision win over Hermosillo, uh, Rigoberto Hermosillo. Now, why that is interesting is because that's the last time he fought a southpaw. Gary Russell Jr. is a southpaw. Mark Magsayo is going to have to figure out how to deal with Gary Russell's angles, not to mention his hand speed, but also the fact that Gary Russell, yeah, is a southpaw, and Magsayo didn't look great in his last fight against one, Hermosillo. Oh, and by the way, it should be noted that between that Julio Ceja and the Hermosillo fight, uh, Magsayo had fought Pablo Cruz, and this was a fight where... Man, his jab was looking beautiful. This resulted in a fourth round TKO. It was only scheduled for eight rounds, but he has such a nice pop to his jab. And then you started seeing him double up on punches, which could play an important role against Gary Russell Jr. Freddie Roach is a very smart trainer. So Gary Russell Jr. in his last fight against King Tug Niambiar won like 
five of the six first, you know, five of the first six rounds. So he was basically in cru not cruise control because King Tug started to come on, but King Tug pretty much needed like multiple knockdowns or a stoppage to win the fight because Gary Russell Jr. had built up such a lead on the scorecards. But King Tug started to really make Gary Russell have to sit in the pocket and battle it out. King Tug started really going to the body, similar to how Seha was going to the body against Mark, uh, Mark Maxayo. If Mark Maxayo can, go, can commit to Russell's body in the same way that King Tug did late in the fight where, you know, he had Russell basically having to fight a little bit more in the trenches than Russell normally does. Now, what Russell will do, even late into fights, he'll start off the round really hot. He'll start off throwing like just super fast, hard combinations of punches, just where it looks scintillating, where like you're thinking, oh, damn, Gary Russell Jr. is really taking it to him in the first like 30 seconds, 20 seconds of this round. And then it starts to take a more measured pace where Russell's strategy is to let his punches go, but to angle out of the pocket before the opponent could start hitting him with power shots. But by the end of this King Tug versus Gary Russell fight, King Tug was able to stay in there in the trenches and Gary Russell was able to pivot out of the pocket less frequently and less quickly. So if Maxayo can not get deterred when he's going to clearly be outspeeded and you know he's going to get beat to the punch by the southpaw, the fast southpaw Gary Russell Jr., if Maxayo doesn't get discouraged, sticks to the game plan, keeps on applying intelligent pressure, not like head over skis because Russell will counter you and, and hurt you badly if you do. It has to be intelligent pressure, but commits to the body early and often. This could be a very interesting fight, especially because of Gary Russell Jr.'s long layoff. Again, it'll have been about two years since he last fought that fight against King Tug. So Russell is now 33 years old. He's not a big fighter to begin with. He's five, four and a half, very small for the division. So, you know, his speed, his reflexes, coordination and skill are so essential to where I believe that when there's an even a slight drop off in like athletic ability or sharpness for Gary Russell Jr. I think he's going to be a little ripe for the picking against some of these younger oncoming fighters like the 26 year old Mark Maxayo. The question is, is now the time that that happens? Is that inactivity, the age, the, you know, the fact that he's not, he doesn't have his dad in with him in the gym day in and day out as his trainer. And he's again, largely by his own admission, kind of training himself for this fight and he said that it's been a very hectic experience but you know he is one of those tough dudes who's like but you know I, I just got to handle my business and so we'll take care of it but I don't know if this is the fight that this all catches up with Gary Russell Jr. I feel like it's such a delicate state that a boxer has to be in for them to operate on the highest level, especially when they have to thread the needle with the speed and reflexes in the way that Gary Russell has been over the past several years. And this is going to have some inter interesting moments, I think. And it's going to be really interesting to see how much Maxayo stays undeterred and keeps applying his pressure and whether he can win any of the early rounds and how much Gary Russell Jr. starts to slow down and wilt over the second half of the fight. You know, I'm going to give Gary Russell Jr. the benefit of the doubt. And I, I'm going to take Gary Russell Jr. via decision here. I think Maxayo is going to get, you know, beaten in majority of the early rounds. I think that he's going to, you know, start catching Russell to where it's going to be very exciting for the crowd. Because when you see the underdog kind of taking out the longtime champion or at least connecting with him, letting some punches go, it's going to appear exciting. But I think that a lot of those early punches are going to be blocked or just kind of grazing. Gary Russell Jr. likes to keep a high guard. Again, moves his trunk pretty well. Is beautiful at moving angles wise. So I think that he's going to be able to stay out of harm's way when Maxayo's at his most dangerous. Now, the scary part about Maxayo is that this knockout over Seha was a 10th round KO. So he carries power late. 
I wouldn't be totally surprised if this was the fight where Max Sayo, you were basically Gary Russell Jr. loses. And I mean like loses, loses. Not like a close decision like he did against Vasily Lomachenko, but basically where the, the where the jig is up, essentially. But I think that it's more likely that Gary Russell Jr. wins via decision. Even though, again, he didn't look great in like the last three to four rounds against King Tugney Ambiar. Granted, Russell did win like eight rounds or nine rounds in that fight. So it's not like it was a razor close win over King Tug, but it got kind of difficult with him in there. I think that the same type of fight is going to play out between him and Maxayo, where Russell does build a lead. Maxayo is at some point, I think, going to need a knockdown or more to win the fight. And it's going to get more interesting in the latter rounds. But uh, Russell, with his experience, with his hand speed, with his straight left hand, and, you know, Max Sayo's foot speed, I don't think could keep up with Gary Russell's. Granted, he is trained by Freddie Roach, and he, the Filipino, like Manny Pacquiao before him, had vastly improving footwork under the tutelage of Freddie Roach. But I think that much of Pacquiao's footwork is natural, God-given. Like, he was, he has certain abilities that other people just don't have in terms of hand speed and foot speed. Not too dissimilar from Gary Russell. Both Pacquiao and Russell are southpaws. Very different fight styles, but they are both blessed with amazing foot speed. Pacquiao's foot speed is more visible because of how he applies his legs and foot speed. But... The hand speed as well. Both Pacquiao and Russell are blessed with amazing, elite, like top one percentile hand speed. But I do worry about Gary Russell Jr.'s 33-year-old legs in this case against, again, a 26-year-old dangerous Mark Maxayo. But I'm still going to take Gary Russell Jr. via... Is this going to be a split decision or unanimous decision? I think I'm going to go unanimous decision here for Gary Russell Jr. But you might see more of a 113 to 115. I'm sorry, 115 to 113 scorecard in the mix to, to where, you know, the, the other judges in the King Tug fight had it like, again, 8 to 4, 9 to 3. I think one of them had it 10 to 2. I don't think it's going to be that lopsided for Gary Russell Jr. over Maxayo. Again, I just think that he's a little too out of practice to be clicking on all cylinders. If he does win this fight, I really hope that he fights again in 2022. And I hope that it's a meaningful fight. Not that Maxayo's chopped liver. I think that he's got a future ahead of him, no doubt. And he did just capture the imagination with that knockout over Seha. But I do want to see Gary Russell Jr. fight a Leo Santa Cruz who's making his return to the featherweight division or against, you know, the winner of Josh Warrington and Kiko Martinez or the winner of Lee Wood who just upset Zhu Khan, uh, the winner of Lee Wood and Michael Conlon out of Ireland. Like, I would love to see Gary Russell Jr. fight one of them. But most desirably, I'd like to see Gary Russell Jr. fight you know, who I see as the class of the division or the other class of the division right now with Leo. I mean, Leo Santa Cruz is still there with the super WBA belt. Lee Wood has the regular title. Santa Cruz has the, the super title. But I really want to see Gary Russell Jr. fight the WBO champion, Emmanuel Navarrete, who is uh, promoted by uh, on top rank. But so, I mean, who knows how the hell that's going to go down. But I, I just need to see Gary Russell Jr., somebody as, who's been as great and as talented and as exciting and special as Russell's been. I just need to see him fight the fights that matter. But yeah, let me know what you think about Gary Russell Jr. versus Mark, Mark Maxayo. You know, the, the odds aren't super lopsided. So that tells you that there are concerns about Gary Russell Jr.'s age, inactivity. Inactivity more so than age, even though, yeah, 33 isn't a spring chicken in these lighter divisions. And again, Mark Maxayo is looking like he can have a hell of a future if things continue to go his way. But yeah, let me know what you think about this one in the comments. Uh, please like the video, subscribe to the channel if you are into the fight talk. I'm Wook. Thanks for tuning in.